The periodic table of the elements is a very useful tool in chemistry. The first thing to notice about it is that the elements are divided into metals, non-metals and metalloids. And the metalloids are also called semi-metals. They're far more metals than any other kind of element. You find the metals on the left-hand side of the periodic table. Hydrogen is not a metal even though you do find it also on the left. You probably know these two metals. Steel wool is made largely of the metal iron and we use copper in electricity wires in our homes. Metals tend to be shiny, flexible and good conductors of electricity. The symbol of iron is Fe that comes from the Latin word ferrum and the symbol of copper is Cu and that also comes from a Latin word cuprum. The non-metals are found on the right hand side of the table except for hydrogen. You're probably familiar with these two non-metals, carbon and sulfur. We use carbon in our pencils. We say that it's pencil lead but actually it's not lead at all. It's a mixture of carbon and clay. Chocolate is also made of carbon and funny enough diamond is also made of carbon but in diamond the carbon atoms are so densely packed that the diamond is very hard instead of being soft and black like charcoal sulfur is yellow you might have come across sulfur in your pharmacy or maybe a nursery where they sell plants because you can use sulfur to kill bacteria and fungi and snails in the garden non-metal tend to be dull rather than shiny and brittle rather than flexible. That means that if you try to bend them, they will break or shatter. They also tend to be poor conductors of electricity, to be insulators often. But you must always remember there are exceptions. Graphite, the black form of carbon, is a good conductor of electricity. It's a resistor actually, but still, it's not an insulator. The symbol of carbon is C and sulfur is S. The semi-metals are also called the metalloids. And they have some properties that are the same as metals and other properties that are like non-metals. The metalloids are very important for making electronic components. Besides those three main groupings in the periodic table, we see that the elements are arranged in rows and columns. And that's important because it groups similar kinds of elements together. So if we understand how this arrangement has been done and the meanings of the groupings, then we can deduce a lot of information just by looking at where the element is on the periodic table without us having to memorize all that information. We call rows periods. Period one only has two elements in it hydrogen and helium. Hydrogen and helium are found in the sun and they are the least dense elements in the universe. Periods two and three each have eight elements in them. And then from period four onward, there are more than eight elements per period. And those in-between elements are called the transitional metals. There are a few very well-known transitional metals like copper, iron, zinc, lead, silver, gold, mercury. But beyond that, at school level, we don't really focus on the transitional metals. We mainly focus on the first 20 elements, hydrogen to calcium. And we find those first 20 in these eight columns. We call columns in the periodic table groups. Now there are different ways of numbering these groups but for school level chemistry because we're only interested in these eight this tends to be maybe the best way. Now some of these groups have special names. The first group minus hydrogen is called the alkali metals. Lithium Li, sodium Na from the Latin natrium, potassium K also from the Latin kalium, rubidium, cesium, francium. The alkali metals are soft and light grey in colour. 
They're very reactive. And the further down on the group that you go, the more reactive they are. So here you can see sodium. If you put sodium in water, it floats on the water. All alkali metals have a very low density. That's why it floats on the water and it reacts very violently. Here's potassium, K. Notice it also reacts similarly. It also floats and it reacts very violently. And in both cases, the product at the end is a soluble base, an alkaline. So the water feels soapy at the end in both cases. And when you add universal indicator, then it turns purple. And that shows that we have a base. And that's why we put these two and the others in this group in the same group, because they have similar properties to one another. The word alkali comes from the Arabic word alkali which means ashes. And that's because burnt plant ashes contain potash, which is potassium carbonate. Today, when we use the word alkaline, we mean a base which can dissolve in water. Because ashes are alkaline, they can be used as a soap. Group two elements are called alkaline earth metals. Magnesium, Mg is an example. Alkaline earth metals are denser and less reactive than alkali metals. So if you put some magnesium inside water, it sinks. It doesn't float like sodium and potassium did. And also it doesn't react violently with the cold water like the alkali metals do. But it is still pretty reactive. If you burn magnesium, it forms a bright white light. In the olden days, that was how they made flashes for cameras. Like the alkali metals, the alkaline earth metals react to produce soluble basic, in other words, alkaline products. And you can recognize that because it feels soapy after you've reacted magnesium oxide with water. Feels soapy to the touch and when you add universal indicator, it turns blue, showing that we have a soluble base. An alkaline. Now let's go to the far right. Group 8. Helium, neon, argon, krypton, xenon, radon. Those are the noble gases. They're called noble because they're inert. They don't react. Like the noble people in the olden days who were too dignified to show emotion, these elements don't react. They're called noble gases because they're gases at room temperature. Neon used to be used a lot in lights to make signs. Noble gases, mainly argon, may still be used in fluorescent light tubes. The group next to the noble gases is the halogens. Fluorine, chlorine, bromine, iodine, and astatine. The halogens are very reactive non-metals. And the higher up in the group that you go, the more reactive they are. So fluorine is the most reactive non-metal that exists. And so it's very dangerous, very reactive. And it doesn't exist outside the laboratory usually. Also, you wouldn't have it in a school laboratory. Chlorine is just under fluorine and it's far less dangerous. And so we tend to use it a lot in a school laboratory. It's also easy to make in a school laboratory. It's a dense poisonous green gas with a sharp smell. You're probably more familiar with the forms that chlorine is sold in. For example, reacted and dissolved in water to make a bleach and a disinfectant. Chlorine breaks down color pigments. That's why we can use it as a bleach. It also breaks down bacteria and algae and other organisms. That's why we can use it as a disinfectant and a pool cleaner. Halo means salt and gen means forming, like in Genesis. So that means halogen means salt forming. The halogens form salts when they react with metals. So for example, if sodium burns in chlorine, then you will get sodium chloride. And that is called table salt, which you can put on your food. So in summary, we've learned that there are three main groups in the periodic table. Metals on the left, non-metals on the right, and metalloids in between. Rows are called periods. Columns are called groups. Some important groups are group one, the soft, low density and very reactive alkali metals. Group two, the harder, more dense and less reactive alkaline earth metals. 
Group 8. The inert noble gases. And Group 7. The reactive non-metal halogens.